Hello and welcome to the Spectrum Show, the show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Welcome to the last episode in Series 4. The contents of this episode have changed several times over the last six months, and I was left with a difficult decision once I had made my choice. The feature created took a lot longer than I expected to make, and even after editing it down, it came in at just under 30 minutes. So my choice was cut it down even further, and throw in some news and a game review, or just give you the full feature on its own. So, if you want game reviews, news, tips and the demo, you'll be disappointed. But you may enjoy this episode anyway. So, here it is, the full length feature in all its glory. Clive Sinclair launched his assault on the home micro market in 1980 with the release of the lowly ZX80. This monochrome, sandless white block was to create a spark that still glimmers today. Shortly after, the ZX81 came along, and at a price range undercutting the rivals, it started to sell large quantities to groups of people other than electronic fanatics or university geeks. Publishers identified a blossoming market and quickly began to roll out magazines to cater for the infant industry. Computer magazines were not new though, they had been around for years. Personal Computer World is generally known as Britain's first computer magazine, starting life in February 1978. Its contents covered everything, it had to, there was nothing else like it at the time. There was news, bench tests, letters, features, game reviews and masses of adverts. In fact, adverts took up most of the space, but at least nothing was excluded. It was a serious magazine, both in size and content, with page counts often running to more than 350. As each new micro was launched, it would feature on the front cover, and Sinclair's machines were not left out. Oddly enough though, they always seemed to be accompanied by chimpanzees. Practical computing came along six months later, in August 1978, catering for the larger, hugely expensive lumps of metal that were far outside the reach of Mr. Average. These machines also didn't play games, or at least not to the extent of the soon-to-come rash of new micros. The magazine tended to look down on the smaller home computers coming into the market, and gave Sinclair's microdriver hammering, saying, is the Spectrum suitable? If all aspects of the business are to be put into the computer, probably not. The microdrives are not good enough. They did occasionally mention the Spectrum though, with a few game reviews here and there. There was also Computing Today, launched in March 1979. Again, another hobbyist magazine that covered a wide range of subjects from DIY hardware to program listings and home and business computers. PC Electrical Electronic Press, the publishers of Practical Computing, noticed this trend and spawned a system magazine to try and grab some readers. And so, in June 1981, Your Computer was born. Your Computer was aimed at home users, as the issue one cover clearly indicates. Amidst masses of adverts, the magazine included reviews of home computers, interviews, DIY projects, program listings, and of course, letters and news. From the start, they provided typing programs that were not just basic, they included machine code. And this was a trend that continued through most of the magazine's life. It was a serious magazine that also did games reviews. Some would say the ideal magazine for home micros, but not the best for people who just wanted games. Your computer had a loyal following. It was a huge publication with lots of pages and took a while to get through. Micro Decision came along sometime in the early 80s. At least that's my guess, as I struggled to find any information about the magazine. The earliest issue I could find was from December 1981. 
I do have two copies of this magazine, and rather stern and serious they are too. Micro Decision seemed to be very much business focused, containing features on networking, software leasing for businesses, job agencies, and hardly anything at all about home micros. There was of course the news and software releases, but these were all financial packages or spreadsheets, not a game in sight. Yes, this was a business magazine, and the sort of thing you would buy if you were looking to set up or improve your existing business, and needed some computer advice. Came one of the longest running computer magazines that only ceased paper publication in 2004, Computer and Video Games, or as it would come to be known, CNVG. Launched in November 1981, this magazine was mainly aimed, as its title suggested, at games players, and as such its covers were emblazoned with images of spaceships, dragons and aliens. Inside the readers got news and reviews of games, not only from the arcades, but also across multiple formats, including the new Sinclair machines. The style was factual and enthusiastic, the content included typing games for all formats, and a serialised cartoon, The Bugs. Yes, it was a gamer's magazine through and through. The style changed as the magazine got older though, with the inclusion of playing tips and game maps, but the reviews grew to take up more space, leaving behind typings and placing them in special pullouts or supplements. New sections included The Bug Hunters, a sort of agony ant for lost gamers, and an adventure helpline, hosted initially by Keith Campbell. As 1982 moved on, it was plain to see, even then, that the Sinclair machines were outselling their rivals, with the new Spectrum boasting colour, sound and high resolution graphics. ECC publications decided to join the party, but this time only Sinclair's Prodigy were invited. Sinclair User was launched in April 1982, and was aimed more at the serious user than a full-on gamer. It contained features about using the machine in schools and businesses, new hardware, and even columns about how to write machine code. Typing games were also included as well as game reviews, playing tips, and industry interviews. One of the more well-known people to write for the magazine was Andrew Hewson, who owned the software company Hewson Consultants. His monthly column covered many subjects including machine code, tutorials, and programming tips. This format stayed in place until November 1986, when the magazine went through a sort of reboot and became less serious. The familiar logo vanished and the letters page became littered with irrelevant images. For some this was a backward step, as gamers were getting older not younger, but that was just my opinion, and I know a lot of people like the new format. We're still in April 1982 though, and a more serious entry arrived, which micro? Covering the larger machines like IBM, Olivetti, Fortune and Sirius, it did include the home micros and even typing programs. The business side of things meant it never really took off as a home user magazine, and there was more approachable reading to be found elsewhere in the newsagents. The magazine did, however, announce Sinclair's new ZX84 computer in February 1984, which I presume ended up as being the QL. All of the magazines that were available were either quarterly, bi-monthly or monthly, which left a space for a more dynamic news-focused publication, and in the same month, April 1982, Popular Computing Weekly was launched. Initially, this was a bright in-your-face addition to the shelves, with impressive cover designs, but inside was a serious news magazine, covering the major formats and providing reviews, tips and type-ins, but no game reviews initially. In November 1982, readers were in for a shock. Gone were the flashy covers, replaced instead with a newspaper style cover, and I like this look and bought this magazine regularly for about four years. 
the content remained the same, with special features and an adventure helpline run by Tony Bridge joining the pages. Also, Automata UK took over the back page to advertise their games in a way only a UK company could. Game reviews were covered later in the magazine's life, but this was a purely news-focused publication. The magazine also went through various changes, but somehow never lost its unique look. 1985, 86 and 87 saw the cover change only slightly, using better quality paper and moving to full colour. Still in 1982, and the magazines were coming thick and fast. Next came Sinclair programs from EMAP Publishing. All the other magazines included typing games as part of their content, but now the users got a dedicated publication. The games were nearly all just basic, with no machine code at all, and the quality sometimes left a lot to be desired. Later issues gained a new section, as well as help and game reviews, probably trying to save the flagging format. Still in 1982 and a month later, Argos Press launched ZX Computing. More of a direct competitor to Sinclair user, ZX Computing included hardware reviews, news, special features and of course game reviews. This was another favourite of mine because it covered all the things I was interested in and didn't focus on any specific area. I also liked how the typing games were very well documented, with explanations for each part of the code and usually a screenshot of the game, very useful when deciding if you wanted to spend time typing all that code out. The magazine was also a different size to the others and had a thicker cover, usually covered with images of ZX81s or Spectrums in the early days. They also used a lot of movie screen grabs to illustrate their typings. In May 1986 the format changed and the familiar cover got a makeover, and some say, including myself, for the worst. A new logo appeared and the whole magazine got rebooted with a new style and layout. It was, allegedly, more up to date, but seemed to just look like Sinclair User after its restyling. Games reviews were not given scores, just a cartoon of some thing being happy, sad or just plain distraught. All very childish, I thought. Back to the serious side of things again and Watt Micro launched in June 1982. Again, very heavy reading with top-end business computers and peripherals taking the main space. The home micros did get a mention in amongst the apricots, compacts, einsteins and adams, and there were even games reviews, albeit very stern and professional. Not only that, but even typing games made an appearance. In August 1982, Personal Computing Today arrived onto the shelves. And straight away you could tell it was for the home user. Inside this multi-format magazine was coverage of all major micros including the Commodores, Oric, Atari, Memotech, Jupiter and of course the ZX81 and Spectrum. There was the usual news pages, typing games and letters as well as special features looking at different aspects of the micro world including hardware and computer reviews. Games were high on the agenda too with software reviews for all of the systems and a handy scoring system that let you see how well the games did at a glance. They did show game covers in the reviews but hardly any screenshots. There was a good technical section too for readers to ask questions and a peripheral section. This magazine seemed to cover everything there was even a micro comparison section, so you could see how your home computer matched up to the competition. Finally we're coming to the end of 1982, and Sinclair Projects came along. A risky diversion into hardware related features and DIY electronics, almost heralding back to the early ZX80 days. There was a new section too, that mainly covered hardware and the usual letters section. This magazine was aimed at a small percentage of users and was very short-lived. 
1983 arrived, so did more magazines. It seemed there was still shelf space left, and in March along came Personal Computer News, a new brash and bright weekly multi-format magazine. Having more pages than the other weekly, Popular Computing Weekly, it covered a lot more across the same microbase collection. News, letters, hardware features, special features like the one on the Spectrum from June 1983 showing the original design of the microdrive. The games reviews had a novel scoring system and also it had an interesting take on typing listings. Each week they published part of a program so to complete it you had to buy the next few issues. Very cunning. The magazine covered not only home micros but business machines as well and going in depth into peripherals and how they worked, all very interesting. Competing with this and Popular Computing Weekly came another weekly magazine, Home Computing Weekly, in the same month as well. This featured much the same content and looked in many cases almost identical to Popular Computing Weekly. There was the usual news, software reviews, special features and interviews as well as letters and of course type-in programs. Some issues even had a saucy lady on the cover. It was also one of the first magazines to give scores for individual aspects of the game and had special interviews with companies and it was also one of the very few to interview Ultimate Play the Game during their heyday. Gaming was now becoming big business and in June 1983, we got another multi-format magazine, the short-lived Personal Computer Games. Aimed again at gamers, the content's focus was games reviews. The magazine also had news sections, hardware features and typings. There was also celebrity interviews. But looking back at the magazine, during its short life, its style changed and in the later issues it definitely reminded me of Yor Sinclair, in both layout and style. Later in its life the magazine copied Crash and had multiple opinions for each game review. In the same month TV Gamer came along, again mainly aimed at console gamers. It covered Atari, Vectrex, Intellivision and ColecoVision. Later it also included the home micros, with games reviews, very short ones, and the usual news. It also borrowed an idea from computer and video games, by covering arcade games as well. One article that made me chuckle was entitled The Sinclair Computers, where the Spectrum is tested to see if it can be a potential games playing system. This was from April 1984, by which time the Spectrum had long since been established as a good games machine. With the Spectrum at the top of the pile, 1984 started with another dedicated magazine, Your Spectrum. Launched in January, this relatively small magazine gave us pretty much everything a user could want. There was machine code tutorials, news, special features, a saucy lady, ok only in issue 1 programming tips and games reviews. Issue 2 had a giant poster of Ant Attack and a special competition. I entered that and completely failed to win. Not that I'm bitter or anything, but when they said details will be published in two newspapers and they only put them in one, the one I didn't buy, it became, ok let's carry on. Your Spectrum quickly gained a new large following, with its great mix of technical and non-technical content. They even created a new basic programming language, MegaBasic, that gave game programmers a lot of new features. Not that I can recall anything ever being published using it though. Games reviews came courtesy of the Joystick Jury. These were three people who offered their opinions and gave a much wider view of the games. Realising that having a publication just for the Spectrum, with the word Spectrum in the title, could limit the publication's life so the publishers decided to change the name in January 1986 to Yar Sinclair. The content was restyled, 
and it looked to have been done by the same people who rebooted Sinclair User. Much more adolescent focused, with supposedly funny photographs and witty writing. The whole focus seemed to have moved from being a good mix of technical, serious and game content to a more laid-back youth-style magazine. There was even a gossip column called Teasers, and when it became clear that it was a female writer, that sent many a young lad into spasms, and the magazine played on this. A new section, called Front Lines, although containing relevant information, had a bit of a messy layout. The game's reviews were fair, and if any game was deemed to be good enough, it was given the Mega Game Award. The reviews themselves often slipped into adolescent humour, or pun-throwing contests, although the scoring system was easy enough to understand, and could have been used without reading all of the drivel. There were special features and interviews, but again, they thought it was clever to ask stupid questions. Like several other magazines, they also had a few cartoon strips including Wally Monthly and the smaller one, Doodle Bugs. There was a section called Train Spotters too, where readers wrote in, pointing out errors and mistakes from previous issues. And again, like other magazines, there was an adventure section penned by Mike Gerard with reviews and adventure help. Much of the content had interjections from the editor, which soon became annoying, at least to me, but a lot of the younger Spectrum owners seemed to enjoy it. At least the magazine had a good hacking section, giving players the means to cheat at games, but even this didn't escape from the childish writing. Another new feature was previews, or as they called them, future shocks. Something that would come back to haunt them, and almost every other Spectrum magazine that did this. Games were previewed, based usually on incomplete or demo code, or in some cases just screenshots. The reviewer would say it was a fantastic game, and lavish compliments on it, and then, when the game finally arrived, if it ever did, it was usually rubbish. Your Sinclair continually changed their image and styling, and the pages got more splashes of colour, sometimes making it hard to read the text, but the writing style continued. As the game's release dwindled, so did the number of pages, and they even started to cover Sam games, but at least when the final issue did arrive, the back page said it all. Even this wasn't the end for Yor Sinclair though. In 2004, Retro Gamer magazine released Tribute Issue, Issue 94. The style of the main Spectrum magazines tended to split the playground. Some preferring serious, well-informed and written articles of Sinclair User and ZX Computing, others a more relaxed and jokey style of Yor Sinclair. But there was a new kid about to come onto the block that would take them all on. February 1984 saw the release of Crash. Initially a mail order catalogue with a few reviews, this new beer moth pounced on the market with its brilliant covers and masses of game reviews. It was a games mag through and through, with pages and pages of reviews for both old and new games released across many different game styles. The reviews were well written, informative and concise, and many gamers used the reviews to decide their next purchase. They went into more depth, with separate sections for different aspects of the game and large screenshots. They also introduced the Crash Smash, a game or number of games they deemed to be best of the month. Some software companies even used that in their advertising. The range of software encompassed every aspect of computer use too, from arcade and adventure and strategy games through to education and business use. It wasn't just games too, hardware got a mention now and again, with features about printers or disk drives. With all these games they just had to have a playing tip section, with pokes, hints and game maps to help the needy player. This section grew and often took up several pages in itself. Of course they had new sections and special features, like company profiles and interviews, much the same as the other magazines at the time, but somehow they seemed to do it better. It wasn't childish, it wasn't too technical either, and they wrote for the average user, and the users responded, making Crash the best-selling Spectrum magazine. It wasn't perfect, as like Yor Sinclair, it often featured previews, 
and was sometimes accused of giving high scores to games in exchange for advertising. They had several long-running comic strips too, The Terminal Man and Jetman, and they even had a serialised novel-like story, Tamara Knight, written by Mel Croucher from Automata UK. The styling and format drifted only slightly across the years, no large-scale changes or reboots like the others, and this seemed to keep the magazine in favour. It did, however, drift over to the Yaw Sinclair side of the fence as its days grew numbered, which was a shame really, especially for such a well-put-together publication. After all this, we're still in 1984, and the multi-format approach had been quiet for a while, until April, when VNU launched a Big K. Apart from covering multiple formats, the inner content was pretty much the same as everything else at the time. There was nothing new, nothing different, nothing that made it stand out. Which is probably why it failed as quickly as it did, lasting only 11 months. There was the usual news items and industry gossip, typing games, adventure sections and features. Occasionally they had hardware reviews and randomly thrown in sections about the movies or American software. Like computer and video games, it also had an arcade section as well as covering machines like the Commodore, Sinclair, Auric, Intellivision, Dragon, Atari and many others. The games reviews were short given a big K rating of 1 to 3, depending on how good they were. One thing that stands out, at least from a Spectrum perspective, is the coverage of Bandersnatch in issue 9. Not much was said, but there was a few screenshots of the game. After this, the magazine industry quietened down, with the shelves bulging from excellent content that covered most users' requirements. It would be another 12 months before the next one came along. Lasting a little longer than Big K was Computer Gamer, launched in April 1985. It contained the usual mix of news, features and arcades, but it was too late to the show. Most of the reviews were short, only having long in-depth pieces for certain games. Like many other games-focused magazines, it had an arcade section too, taking a look at the arcade games of the day. It also had a quite large adventure section, there were already magazines doing all of this though, and I'm not saying it wasn't a good read, because it was, but just not different enough to make a buyer move away from their existing magazine. The new 16-bit machines were now beginning to filter into the market, and with them, new dedicated magazines. The multi-formats though kept on coming, adding the new machines to their content, but keeping the spectrum included, at least for now. Ace and the Games Machine both launched in October 1987, and both were big hitters. Glossy covers, great artwork, plus the lure of all these wonderful looking games for the Atari ST, Amiga and Mega Drive. The end of the 8-bit era was drawing even closer, and the dedicated magazines had their days numbered. 1984 and the Sinclair projects folded. 1985 saw the demise of Big K, Personal Computer Games, TV Gamer, Home Computing Weekly, Personal Computing News and Sinclair programs. 1987 saw us waving goodbye to ZX Computing and Computer Gamer. In 1988, Your Computer and New Computer Express printed their final issues. And What Micro ended sometime around here too, but I couldn't find the definite date. As for the remaining Sinclair dedicated magazines, Crash lasted until 1992. Sinclair user vanished from the shelves a year later in 1993, as did Your Sinclair and computer and video games ended its paper life in 2004. But lasting all the way to June 2009, the magazine that started it all finally called it a day, and the final issue of Personal Computer World left the shelves forever. We got a good run for our money, with a lot of great magazines providing a wide range of material spread over 10 years. That's a long time in the computer industry, and Sinclair's machines shone bright, a beacon of British brilliance. It's great to flick through these old magazines, as I do for the news for each show, but it's also nice just to pick one at random and read it, to see what was going on. If you haven't got the original paper copies, there are several places on the internet 
where you can download them onto your computer or tablet, and it's a great way to relive those dizzy days of home computing. This may not have been an exhaustive look at every single magazine, but it certainly was exhausting. I know I have missed some out, not because I wanted to, but because there simply wasn't enough information about them. Magazines play an important part in any hobby, or even business, and we've just seen some great examples. They help us make purchasing decisions. They help us get further in games. They give us programming advice. They give us free games. They update us on the news. And most of all, they entertain us. This episode was short on games, but I still hope you enjoyed it nonetheless. See you in the next series. <laughs>